POS became a really popular term, quality of service. The thing is that most of the implementations really looked at the classification header of the packet. Said, ooh, this is marked as EF, voice traffic, and tried to prioritize that. And in fact, only two major classifications became popular. One is in, uh, best effort, which is the standard um, immediate, I said to say three, immediate and background. And those three classes of traffic are the very things that Wonder Shaper uses. Uh, but, again, our bandwidth went up and Wonder Shaper stopped working. And at the same time, Wi-Fi became popular. Um, how many of you guys use Wi-Fi? I remember when we didn't have Wi-Fi, and that was only 14 years ago. If we go looking for the RLAN wireless how-to, that's how I got involved in this, and it goes back a ways. Anyway, uh, prior to that particular how-to, I was involved in the Mosquito Net Network Research, which used the Metrocom Radio was one of the first uh, Wi-Fi implementations that implemented IP. And the really cool thing about that is that we discovered that TCP IP, the protocol, the loss-based protocol that we have, didn't work over this system at all. Zip. Did not work. Could not get out of slow start. It would die under any number of radio creating conditions. So the early attempts at running IP over uh, wireless links failed. And it was pretty much universally acknowledged by, I don't know, 1997, 98 or so, that you needed to have an additional um, acknowledgement layer below the IP layer, the MAC layer, saying that when you transmit something over Wi-Fi, immediately transmit, or almost immediately transmit, an acknowledgement that says you got it. And that was great. They made TCP IP work. I have to admit that at the time, I was a big fan of what's called uh, split TCP, whereas when we had a network make a transition between wireless and wired, that you would have a proxy in the way that would have a very short round trip time and give you the ability to have some have more, way more packet loss on wireless and still keep the wired internet function the way it did. And in a lot of ways, I really wish that what would actually happen, that we used web proxies and getting the wireless but what actually happened was something simpler. We just kept adding more levels of acknowledgments and more levels of uh, encodings and stuff below the MAC layer, above the upper line protocols, which already had their own systems for dealing with packet loss. At the same time, we got all that working. We had wireless N, which took the bandwidth and increased it by a factor of six over wireless G. And it did that by cramming a whole bunch more packets into a boatload of packets and then layering on more error correction, retransmits, and retries. And at the same time, everyone in this room adopted wireless for themselves and didn't share it with their neighbors. Which meant that all this, everyone's on the same channels and interfering with each other. And a common and scientific flaw, and this is not something that I do, um, I do, actually, we all do it, is we have a tendency to isolate one variable and run a test, and then isolate another variable and run another test. And you'll find the thinking throughout the internet was, ooh, it goes fast, and ooh, it's low latency. But we've not worked testing both of those at the same time for a very long time. Uh, this is one of the things that irks me very much about speed tests. I've had. They have a wonderful performance test and they have a wonderful peak test and they don't run them at the same time. So, some more time goes by. We're in 2010 now. Uh, and they had a study come out of what typical latencies have become in the home from a group, uh, the ICSI Medical Advisor group. This is a really hard scatter plot to explain. And there's much more detail on it on the internet. But basically, it took each kind of technology, blue is cable, red is DSL, and G is and green is fiber, and tried to infer the buffer lengths from the kind of signal you got by flooding the size of the bottle, the bandwidth bottle, with 
packets until it started to drop them. And it turned out that most people were using powers of two. That's what the clear bands you see there are, powers of two. And the second thing you can infer from this diagram is what the latency under load will be under conditions of saturation. This green line across here, which accounts for roughly half of the measured traffic, is a half a second of delay, one and a half times around the Earth inside of your computer. Next line is one second of delay. Next line is two seconds of delay. Four seconds of delay. And the only reason why this thing cuts off from here is because the test didn't run that long. Again, on the backbone of the internet, I can go from one coast to the United States to the other, and others under 60 ms. Uh, so Jim's kids uh, were bothered bugging him. Every time they did an upload, they went, Dad, can you get off the internet? I was playing a game. So he'd get up, go over to his kid, and say, OK, what's the problem? Oh, it's fine now. <laughs> go back, do whatever he's doing. Dad! And he realized that the act of him getting up and stopping working was really the cause of the problem. <laughs> uh, and he sat and started really working at it and realizing that this was not just his problem with his kids. It was a global problem that was happening everywhere. It even possibly affected what went wrong with one laptop or child where they tried to build a working wireless mesh network. And when they tried to deploy it, they put more than 30 machines in a room, the network melted down. So, uh, Jim has been around for a while. Uh, he's been doing X windows and a few other interesting things. Call up all his buddies. And uh, I ended up working on a similar aspect of the wireless problem in the Rago. I spoke to Jim, I replicated his experiment. And I said, yes, Jim, you're absolutely right. You're on to something. You've discovered a new thing that, or an old thing that we go about. And uh, OK, so we talked to Van and Van, and you know, some of these names you can Google for them, Eric Raymond, and uh, Eric Doomsday, Fred Baker, name of Dave Reed. Dave Reed is the founder of the end to end argument. And we established a website, and we started asking people if they were also seeing this kind of behavior. And uh, the mailing list really grew. Then we had all kinds of people adopting the term and publishing papers. If you do Google Scholar for buffer bloat, you'll find some good stuff out there and some bad stuff. And uh, ad hoc groups formed. And there was a Bismarck project, which I'm not sure if it was the University of Tripoli or Tivoli, uh, but it was based partially out of here in Italy, uh, to go and do more network home measurements. And the data kept coming back. Yes, we have buffer bloat everywhere in the internet. Uh, I managed to miss uh, the putting in the link to the Google video that um, Jim did. Uh, it's very influential and long. It goes into things in detail. So uh, we inspired uh, Eric Dunsay in particular, but almost all the Linux networking people to take a hard look at where the device driver buffering was coming from. So. Uh, we introduced this thing called BQL, and I managed to skip that uh, slide, so I'm not going to do it. So first we looked at the Scholastic Fair queuing algorithm, and we take it from 127 buckets, which did not scale, up to uh, 64K buckets. Uh, I have a picture somewhere of what the hash did to typical TCP flows every 10 seconds. It's ugly. Fix that. Um, and still, despite what we did, it continued to fail to scale, as I kind of showed you there in the previous demonstration. And it just didn't work well enough. So Eric and I started collaborating and thinking that, well, maybe the right thing was a hybrid of the existing incremental technologies. Maybe we needed to actually do the fair killing part and start shooting packets before the queues fill up. And how would that work? And uh, we worked for him. He did, again, most of the work. Uh, we did some prototyping with QMQ, which Dr. Uh, Valenti here uh, worked on 
but she has the ability to try different methods. For example, Celestia Fair Blue was also tried in a combination with another fair queuing technology called QMQ. It was a good but building block for us. And then we realized that we still had a queue link problem. And we needed to have one queue management system that would actually uh, have a limited amount of buffering and do more stuff. Now, historically, people say, oh, you can't do AQM and cost CPU cycles. And that's based on research from the 1990s when the 68020 was the standard processor. Uh, today's CPUs have more than enough horsepower on the embedded gear to do just about anything. Memory is limited. CPU, not so much. So um, we built that. I have wonderful pictures somewhere. Um, and uh, we're excited about it. They introduced a really new technique called head drop, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, instead of doing tail drop, it has enough information about the size of the queue to provide earlier signaling. Never been done before. And it was astoundingly successful. It, it looked beautiful. We handled lots of strange and exciting, but it was still unbelievably hard to configure. But it did end up to the Linux kernel. It's in Linux 3.4 later. And the other big problem, I didn't care so much about the configuration issue, but I cared that it did work with variable bandwidth. That didn't work. So meantime, for the past 14 years, uh, after beating their brains out over uh, red, uh, they have been trying, uh, with Kathy Nichols and Van Jacobson, who are a pair, have been working on a successor to it that would meet modern needs. And after fixing all this additional infrastructure and Linux shortening all the key links and making control loops work well, we they announced their paper. I got a preprint. I'm getting old. I don't usually hack for 24 hours straight anymore. But I got the preprint. And 24 hours later, Linux had the first working column implementation. And then I went to sleep. <laughs> And I woke up, Eric Dumaze, who's in France, had improved the performance by like a factor of 100. I went back to sleep. <laughs> and then we worked it like sitting together, but he mostly completely reworked the thing until it was really elegant and a magnificent implementation of the algorithm. And then we had a chance to test it against real stuff. 